So by all accounts, Americans do seem poised for longer work lives. Employment at older ages has been rising since the mid-1990s. Recent cohorts of middle-aged workers tell us that they actually expect to work longer than prior cohorts did. Um, there have been dramatic gains in longevity and health, and importantly, these appear to have translated into increased work capacity at older ages. And of course, there are many potential benefits of longer work lives. We've heard quite a bit about um, some of these today. Um, some improvement in government budgets, better personal financial security, and perhaps even um, better health. On the other hand, the median retirement age, surprisingly, is still 62. More people plan to work at older ages than actually do work at older ages. And we know from a variety of, of work that older job seekers are less likely to find job matches than younger job seekers. Now, there are many reasons why actual employment might be below, quote unquote, potential employment. Um, for example, access to pension income might facilitate increased leisure time, right? Health shocks to oneself or to family members, particularly if um, there's a need to provide caregiving, may push people out of the labor force. And age discrimination may limit some of the opportunities that older workers encounter. Social security policies play a role as well. Undoubtedly, we, have, we still have a social security earnings test for early claimants. But there is another reason um, that hasn't been explored as much, and this is the quality of the job matches that older workers have. Workers, of course, do have preferences over the characteristics of their jobs, and these preferences might actually influence labor supply choices. Moreover, preferences may change with age or even change with focal life events. We know from Marcy Pitkasufis' work that there is qualitative evidence of a gap between desired and actual job characteristics. In particular, older workers say that things they want that they don't seem to be able to get from their jobs are flexibility, meaningful work, better pay and benefits, opportunities for advancement, opportunities to gain transferable skills, that is, that more general human capital, a supportive work environment. But what we ask in this work is, do these gaps have quantitatively important effects on labor force participation? And are older workers any different than younger workers? Does everybody want flexibility in a supportive work environment? Or is there something different about older workers that's um, important to understand? More generally, we're asking the question of what working conditions actually make work sustainable over a longer work life. So a labor economist would, a labor economist would pr approach this question from the perspective of a, of a hedonic model. And in such a model, jobs would be characterized by not just their wage, but also the non-wage attributes, okay? People demand jobs with particular attributes, and a utility-maximizing individual would maximize utility over consumption, over leisure, and also over the job attributes. They would maximize utility subject to a budget constraint, and the wage in their potential employment would enter the budget constraint in that way. That's how that affects the decision problem. So people demand jobs with particular attributes, Firms supply jobs with particular attributes. Firms are profit maximizers, and the cost of producing a particular set of um, job attributes would be constrained by the production technology and by factor markets. So people demand jobs, firms supply jobs. In, in a competitive equilibrium, you would have people matched to jobs, and you would observe a distribution of job characteristics in the economy. Okay? This would be Pareto optimal only under the stylized case of no frictions. So we might ask, well, are all firms able to fill all jobs, and do all workers have their utility maximizing job? Now, there are a variety of reasons to believe that there probably are plenty of frictions. This is not actually the case. Um, just a few workers may have difficulty assessing job matches ex ante. Okay. Jobs tend to come bundled. Characteris job characteristics come bundled in jobs. It may be actually quite difficult to sort of mix and match characteristics according to your particular preferences. Switching costs can inhibit transitions to better matches. Firms may have imperfect information about the productivity of older workers, and if that's the case, they might underinvest in technologies that actually would help compensate for changes in productivity with age. So our approach to this question is as follows. 
First of all, we're going to ask, well, what is that observed distribution of job characteristics in the U.S. economy? And surprisingly, we haven't had um, a, a national survey um, of job characteristics in a very long time, one that's publicly available and really um, geared for scientific research. So we, field, we fielded, I can almost say that now, we have one more week in the field, um, but we have fielded a new survey of working conditions in the U.S. It's called the American Working Conditions Survey. Um, it started in July and we, um, we, we will close the survey uh, next week. We're using the nationally representative Rand American Life Panel, which is an internet-based panel. And excitingly, our survey is harmonized with the sixth European Working Conditions Survey. And this is a survey that's been running in, in, um, in Europe. They're surveying about 40,000 workers in 35 EU countries and EU candidate countries. It's been running every five years for um, 25 years. Um, so this will actually allow us to make international comparisons of working conditions in the US with, um, with uh, conditions in Europe. That's another um, a very exciting aspect of this work that I won't have much to say about today. They're actually, I believe, still in the field, but wrapping up. The second thing we're gonna do is conduct stated preference experiments in the ALP. And the idea behind these is to try to measure preferences over particular job attributes. We pursue this approach in order to solve an important identification issue, which this does solve under certain assumptions. And those assumptions are, of course, very important, but I think it's um, a very interesting methodology. We've completed pilot testing of this work and are, are about ready to go into the field with the full thing, but I'm gonna show you some of our pilot estimates because I think these are very interesting. And finally, we plan to compare preferences for particular job attributes with subsequent employment transitions. That is to see, do stated preferences actually match realized trajectories in any way? So the American Working Conditions Survey addresses a number of survey domains, and um, if anyone's interested, I can, uh, we can make available uh, the questionnaire. In fact, these data will become publicly available um, in the near term. But these are the main domains. We ask, obviously, about wages and salary and employment contracts, about hours, about control over hours, about the location of work, about paid time off, the pace of work, autonomy at work, the experience of stress, physical demands and exposure to variety, a whole host of physical risks, social support at work, learning on the job and training, and the experience of uh, your work as meaningful to you in some way. The preliminary data I'll show you today, they're 95% complete. Um, we expect, we're aiming for a target, uh, a target sample size of 3,000. We're at about uh, 2,858 at this point. Uh, the response rate's about 77%, which is right on par with um, other ALP surveys. And um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just a variety of um, age distributions on a variety of characteristics. And as we go through these, it's important to remember that they are just observational data. They represent both actual differences in the prevalence of particular characteristics by age, but they also represent a very important selection effect, and that is people with the least desirable job characteristics will, of course, be selecting out of those jobs or even out of the labor force entirely relatively early. And I think you can see some evidence of this in the age profiles. We'll go through some of that. So, this, ta this table just compares um, a few very basic labor force statistics from our survey with the CBS. And um, you know, scanning horizontally across the rows, you can see we do pretty well in matching the CPS, as you would expect in a nationally representative survey, with the one exception being the percent reporting they work multiple jobs. And actually, we were not surprised to see a difference there, in part because of uh, differences in the way we asked the question. So the CPS just asked about jobs, uh, multiple jobs worked last week. Our question is picking up multiple jobs over a much longer period. But otherwise, we do match, we have good comparability with CPES across um, a, number, a number of um, basic labor force statistics. Okay, so moving to the first of our, our age profiles. Now there's a lot going on in these graphs, and we've really struggled with um, um, many different ways of trying to portray these data, but let me kind of give you the architecture of the graph and then we'll be able to kind of navigate our way, our way through what they're actually telling us. So what we're showing here is one particular uh, characteristic and that is um, 
uh, working long hours or the intensity of work or a measure of control over hours. And this is working 10 or more hours a day on 10 or more days per month, okay? Um, and we have, this is just one of many, many such measures in this, uh, in this domain. And we're just showing, uh, you know, each bar is showing the percent of workers in a particular group who um, report that job characteristic. Now, the four bars on uh, the left side are for males, okay, and we have them by age. The four bars on the right are for females, again by age. And then we're showing you uh, uh, males without a college degree with the blue bars and uh, workers with a college degree in the red bars, okay? So tracing your eyes along the, along the blue bars and the red bars will give you the, um, the prevalence of these particular characteristics by these different age groups. And you can look at it separately for males as for females. So for this particular characteristic, um, you see that it's the incidence of long hours um, is, or the prevalence of long hours is uh, higher for, for males, in particular males without a college degree. It does appear to fall with age. Um, but there is this very, um, there is also a very um, kind of interesting spike, I would say, for females with a college degree in their 50s. You can see the red, that red spike there. Um, Again, um, just you know, very interesting pattern. We don't have any particular explanations yet for um, what that's about. This is the prevalence reporting that they carry or move heavy loads half the time or more on their job, okay? And here again, this is most common among males without a college degree. And this is a graph in which you can really see evidence of that sharp selection out of the labor force on the basis of a characteristic like this. So between male for males in their 50s compared to males in their, in their 60s, and just focus on the blue bars here, the men without a college degree, you can see the prevalence of uh, people who are working who have that particular characteristic drops dramatically as people enter their 60s, right? Suggests that people are indeed selecting out of the labor force or, out or, or selecting out of these high intensity, very physically demanding jobs with age. It also, I think, um, kind of highlights uh, physically demanding jobs as being a particularly what you might call unsustainable work, work condition over a longer work life. This is standing, people who report standing half the time or more on their jobs. And this is, um, again, highest for uh, males without a college degree. We again see that very sharp drop off as people enter their 60s consistent with them selecting out of these physically demanding jobs or out of the labor force altogether. But, it, but this characteristic is also particularly surprisingly high for females with a college degree. Okay, and you can see, again, those women in their, in their, in their 50s with a college degree um, um, suggests this could, this could be, these could be teachers, these could be nurses, these could be reflecting particular kinds of occupations that, um, that, uh, that women have and might be different for college-educated women, say, compared to um, um, uh, non-college-educated men. Working to tight deadlines, one that's um, near and dearer to our, our lives, um, um, half the time or more. And you can see this is really a persistent job characteristic for the college-educated. Okay. There is, of course, um, evidence of still some selection, even for the college-educated out of these sorts of jobs or even out of the labor force as people enter their 60s. So this is a measure of social support at work, whether people have report that they have close friends at work. And here we're graphing having, not having close friends at work. And what you can see in this graph is that the shortest bars, in particular focus on females here, the shortest bars occur um, when, at, you know, at the oldest ages, when people are in their 60s. And what this suggests is that people are more likely to have friends at work when they're older. And so this, this has been brought up in other literature, but I think we're seeing it here that this, um, this social um, aspect of work may, may have an important bearing on people's labor supply decisions at older ages, particularly among women. There's some very interesting patterns um, in, in these data around friends at work. We also collected information about training. So, how, so what percent of workers had received employer-sponsored training in the past 12 months? And here the patterns are very, very striking. There is a very, very pronounced age gradient 
Now, college-educated workers are more likely to have received training in the last 12 months, but the, in, the prevalence of training declines sharply with age. What incident, yes, whether it happened in the past 12 months. Yeah. We also collected information about uh, training done on one's own initiative. Okay, so we'll be blending that with this picture, I think, to round it out and see if people are compensating for um, not, not getting it through their employers and, um, and um, getting it on their own outside of the work environment. So um, we have a variety of measures of health at work, and these are this is just uh, reports of experiencing stress in your work always or most of the time. And um, this this I think this characteristic is quite interesting because we see similar levels of experience stress for the college educated and those without a college degree. Um, but there is some sign here of relatively higher reported stress for older college educated men. And then I'll just call your attention to this very striking um, downward age pattern for women. So reported stress actually declines with age for women who choose to work at those ages. So stress perhaps declines with age, but even with all the selection out of physically demanding jobs and out of the labor force, the experience of musculoskeletal pain appears to rise. Okay, and you see very interesting patterns here where in all age, across the age groups, the, the experience of musculoskeletal pain, and now we're talking about uh, neck and shoulders and uh, lower extremities and back, so the whole gamut of musculoskeletal pain. The levels are quite high, and um, the pain gaps are quite interesting. So the male gap seems to, um, the, the gap with respect to education appears to narrow, whereas for women it appears to widen. very interesting patterns that we look forward to exploring further. We also have a variety of uh, measures about, um, well, we have a measure of um, satisfaction with working conditions and a measure about life satisfaction more generally. This, is, um, sh this just shows the percent reporting that they are not satisfied with their working conditions. And here we see that dissatisfaction tends to peak in midlife, except for males without a college degree where um, dissatisfaction appears to be relatively persistent with age. We can relate these particular job attributes to satisfaction, and here is just a very, very um, simple regression of our, uh, say, taking the left-hand column, job satisfaction scale on a variety of these work characteristics. And in the interest of time, if you just drop your eyes down to the very last row here, you can see that not having very close friends of, at work reduces work satisfaction statistically significantly. The, that effect is about a magnitude of around 10%. Okay, so not having friends at work tends to reduce your work satisfaction by about 10%. Okay, and there's, um, we have a variety of controls in here already, but this is just sort of kind of um, to, to illustrate that these do appear, these job attributes do appear to have um, meaningful effects on people's experience of satisfaction in their work. We also have um, expectations of working longer, expectations of being able to do the same job, and we can relate these to those as well. We won't go through that today, though. Um, so as I started um, out describing at the beginning, we want to actually measure the value of these job attributes. We appear to see some very interesting patterns in the observational data, but do they have meaningful meaningful impacts on people's um, employment outcomes? And, um, and uh, um, is there some way we can, we can get at this by dealing with some of the inherent selection issues that really kind of limit our ability to make uh, inferences about pe what people really care about? So we recognize that observed job matches, right, are an equilibrium outcome in the economy. And it, in some ways, they do reveal how much people value particular job attributes, okay? And you can imagine taking a hedonic approach here where you would regress wages on job attributes, okay? And you would find the implicit price or, or value of each attribute, okay? And, um, and many people have done this sort of thing, but there is a fundamental identification issue here, which is that the, uh, this, this observational relationship is biased by all kinds of unobserved differences, most notably perhaps productivity, but also these compositional, um, 
flows in and out of the labor force on the basis of job characteristics. It makes it very hard to do this, this kind of work. Um, so a stated preference experiment is just one approach to solving this identification issue. And um, it, of course, has its own assumptions um, and those, um, you know, the, the whether, whether, how the tenability of those is often hotly debated, but we would argue that there's something to learn here from an approach such as this because while it brings in other assumptions, it deals with, with um, other kinds of problems. Um, it, you know, one, I think one advantage of um, this state of preference approach is that you can, you can offer these, um, these choice experiments to people who are out of the labor force. Okay? It's not just a function of those who remain in. And that's what we did. So what we did is create uh, uh, choice sets, and we essentially asked uh, workers in our sample to, um, to um, evaluate two, two jobs, okay? The jobs had a wage and 10 attributes. We randomly varied two of the attributes and the wage across the scenarios. And we simply asked them to, uh, to indicate which one they preferred. Each respondent was asked to evaluate 10 of these scenarios. And I could give an entire talk on this methodology and um, everything that went into it, uh, which we don't have time to do. And of course, I'm only showing you pilot estimates today, but um, I did want to give you a taste of this because we think these are really, um, really interesting. And so um, this is um, uh, uh, some selected estimates from the pilot, uh, the pilot estimates. And so first, the way we read these, so okay, we have two columns going on here. So the first column are younger workers, and we're gonna compare the younger workers to the older workers, right? We're, we wanna know our older workers different in their preferences um, relative to younger workers. Um, so we have a variety of characteristics. These are the ones we experimentally varied across the job pairs. And the, the, the point estimates are the effect of a given job attribute on the predicted probability of saying you'd accept this job, okay? So starting with the first one, the ability to set your own schedule compared to having your schedule set by a manager. Older workers say they would, that their probability of accepting that job would be 11.6 um, percentage points higher compared to a job where they didn't have control over the schedule in the same way. Younger workers care about that too, not as much, and in fact, You'll see that we don't have as much statistical precision on some of these effects, but um, this is the pilot study. This is 50 people asked 10 scenarios, and we, we will have um, abund an abundance of statistical pre uh, precision in the, in the main study. Um, so, in fact, we would be able to detect, uh, if these were the actual point estimates, um, we would be able to detect uh, these are statistically significant differences across. So, um, next, um, I think this result on telecommuting is really actually quite interesting. And you can see here that actually, even though telecommuting is often talked about as a dimension of, of flexibility, it's actually the younger workers who care about telecommuting, not the older workers, okay? So we get uh, younger workers tell us that they'd be 22 percentage points or 20 percentage points more likely to accept a job that, that offered the option of telecommuting. Younger workers, maybe 2 percent more likely to take that job. Another thing we can do actually is because we've also varied the wage, we can compute what these probabilities translate into in terms of a value. And so backing up for a moment, that set your own schedule effect, that 11.6 percentage point increase, if you multiply that by two, is just a kind of a rough approximation, that tells you, that gives you, um, that would be what, 20, 20, uh, 24%, 23%. Um, that's, that says that uh, older workers would value setting their own schedule at about 24% of their hourly wage. Okay, so all of these can be translated into a hedonic metric, if you will. So um, physical activity is valued over sitting, if it's moderate, by both, um, particularly by younger workers and a bit by, by the older workers. But intensive physical activity compared to sitting is strongly disliked by older workers. In fact, they would be 27.5 uh, percentage points less likely to accept a job that had intensive physical activity. And that's equivalent to um, a more than 50 percent, uh, uh, that's the valuation is equivalent to more than 50 percent of their hourly wage. Okay, so that's a very strong, strong effect. Um, the work environment, um, a relaxed environment compared to a fast-paced environment, uh, that's valued more by older workers, 13.5 percentage points more likely to take a job with that particular characteristic. Um, 
how, whether tasks are well-defined or you choose how to do your work, that's a measure of autonomy. And here, you see that, um, that older workers actually don't want well-defined tasks. They would actually be less likely to take a job where everything was laid out and you didn't have to actually figure out how to do it. I think that's quite a bit consistent with some of the other literatures um, in terms of, uh, of what we know. Um, pay time off. Uh, you hear a lot about older workers wanting um, that, that benefits are particularly important to older workers, and we see that here. Ten days of paid time off is better than zero um, for the older workers. Um, 20, 20 days of paid time off is even better still. So about, uh, you can see there, a 37.9 percentage point increase in the probability of taking a job that had 20 days of paid time off compared to zero. Um, and finally, we asked about um, um, so some of the jobs we offered had you working alone, and others you were working in a team. Sometimes when you were working in a team, you'd be evaluated by the performance of the team compared to being evaluated on the basis of your own performance. And the patterns here are also very different by age. Older workers, um, um, would they, they dislike being in a team and being evaluated by the performance of the team. Okay. Um, Older work, younger workers actually seem to like it by about 15 percentage points more likely to take the team-based evaluated on the performance of the team job. And, um, um, but younger workers actually really like the team-based environment and being evaluated on their, on their own performance. That's, um, that's um, you know, a much smaller effect for, uh, for or a much smaller preference for the older workers in that regard. So, um, that's that. We'll be uh, going in the field, um, surveying this on full sample, um, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And um, I look forward to sharing the final estimates with you then. Thanks. <clears throat> My name is John Pencavel. Uh, and I'm pleased to uh, offer uh, a few comments on, on, uh, on this work. Um, I'm going to, um, since it's ongoing, I'm going to try and make uh, a few suggestions. But um, uh, let me try and perhaps uh, emphasize where, if I may, uh, I have some uh, doubts uh, about this uh, approach. Uh, th this I've, I've um, taken from the slides I was sent what I understand to be the uh, principal uh, hypotheses behind this work. Um, and I'll state them here. You can read them. Older job seekers uh, are less likely to find themselves, uh, find matches than younger job seekers. I re read that in the, the slides. There's a gap between the jobs that older workers want and the jobs available to them. Now, this is not obvious to me. It is not. Job seekers are, are unemployed people. Uh, the unemployed uh, are defined as uh, those without a job and looking for a job. But um, when I look, uh, uh, just the other day, uh, the unemployment rate, they're job seekers by definition. Uh, the most recent data, seasonally unadjusted, in September of this year, it was 4.2% among those aged 65 years and over. It was 4.2% among those aged 25 to 54. Uh, I don't see, at first blush, that older workers are... Um, uh, are having a harder time in finding a match uh, than younger workers. Now, the approach that um, is being proposed here is to make use of a survey, the American Working Conditions Survey, of 3,000 workers um, to use responses to questions about the job attributes that the older workers say they value. Now, uh, to answer this question about uh, job seekers less likely to find matches, I would have thought we were on the survey those who don't have jobs. Job seekers. 
this is see, surveying the workers, those who have found the matches. So uh, are we really surveying, uh, unless we want to add the assumption that the preferences of workers and the unemployed uh, are the same, uh, are we not, to answer these questions, are we not surveying the wrong people? Should we be surveying job seekers? Um, and um, and the, it, this, this model of compensating wage differentials that uh, is attributed here to Sherwin Rosen, um, it was in fact um, set out by Greg Lewis. And Greg Lewis showed how difficult it is to extract, to separate the preferences of workers in models like this from the preferences of the employers. Uh, you need, like all identification problems, you really need some variables that workers care about, that about jobs, that employers don't care about, or vice versa. That will allow us to shift one preference set relative to the other. But there are very few such uh, variables, and generally both parties um, have preferences and from a single set of matches, which are the, not, that, that are going to be used here, it's very difficult to extract the workers' preferences and call them workers uh, and separate those from. In other words, the outcome, the wage outcome of workers, um, reflects the relative preference of employers and workers and workers for particular uh, attributes. Separating those two is not straightforward. I do have a prior, I do have a guess, a conjecture about uh, um, a, uh, 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 what I suspect, this is just a guess, of what workers do care about. Um, look at this uh, picture. This is the picture, so I have on the horizontal axis, calendar time, years since 1977 to 2014. And uh, it maps of all those people who are um, aged uh, 65 years and over and who are employed. The percent who are employed full time. And you can, you can see that since uh, 19, in the mid-1990s, that's been growing, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that's been growing uh, remarkably. In fact, you know, it, if I had, uh, if I were measuring not the fraction who are working full time, but the labor force participation rate, it would be similar of older people, it would be similar. In other words, the matter, this, this change that has taken place uh, in the last 30 years or so in the labor force participation, in the work behavior of older people is manifested not only in the labor force participation rate or in the employment population ratio, it's almost also manifested in the fraction who are working full time. And I've, I, in the, the last year, 2014, we have 2014, 60% of um, older workers are working full time. That means 35 hours a week, usually, or more. Now, I, I'm surprised at that. I'm surprised because my prior guess is that as people age, they want to say it's many people, I mean, I'm generalizing, of course. Many, people, many older people want to stay in touch with their job, but would like to work fewer hours. And the fact that you see here a trend towards the reverse uh, is to me somewhat unexpected. Um, it does suggest to me, I, well, let me put it as a question, I wonder if it reflects not at all the preferences of workers, of older workers, but that employers themselves see benefits in maintaining longer uh, work hours for um, their older workers. And I'm not sure, I haven't 
unwrap that idea myself. And I'm, I, I note here in Nicole's um, uh, empirical work to date that workers seem to value, as I would expect, um, uh, paid time off, um, the freedom to not to work. So I, uh, I, I think this is a, a somewhat unexpected uh, uh, result. Um, now, there's another way to approach this, this type of issue, and that is not to ask workers what they, what they value, what they say they value, but to observe. And there's an there's a, a interesting p uh, paper, uh, to the best of my knowledge, unpublished, where the researcher uh, takes the um, Department of Labor's Dictionary of Occupational Titles um, th th this is a manual where, at detailed levels of uh, occupational definition, they are described and defined. He, um, he defined what, loosely, he didn't call them that, I'm calling them this. He defined good jobs and bad jobs by the characteristics of how arduous they were. And simply asked, are older people in jobs that, are, that involve difficult or unpleasant working conditions. And again, I was somewhat surprised. Uh, sorry, there we are. Um, and these, this table, so let me read it. Uh, he, he does different things. And this is, I've simply taken one uh, table here. This is uh, difficult working conditions. And you can see some characteristics that's, uh, uh, jobs have with to be defined as difficult working conditions. Uh, cramp workspace, exposure to uh, abnormal temperatures, contaminants, hazardous conditions, and so on. And, um, and you can see down here uh, uh, those occupations where uh, some of these uh, th that have these characteristics. Well, this, so if you I was surprised that and this is just for people aged 58 and older. And for all those aged 58 and over, um, compare men and women, 38, over a third of men are classified as having been working in, uh, for, for this is from, uh, he's combining, as I say here, CPS data with the data from uh, des descriptions from the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. Uh, more than a third of men, uh, aged 58 or more, are in jobs described as difficult working conditions. And not surprisingly, uh, uh, even 39% um, uh, of men age 70 or more. Okay, you know, I was surprised. Um, not surprising is that these jobs are more characteristic of people in the bottom wage quintile than at the top. Um, uh, so uh, I would, I hope that the survey will um, actually look at questions of distribution, uh, will, that will look at how preferences, trade-offs between attributes and pay, um, how they vary across wage quintiles. With my guess is that the well-off being um, more than willing to um, convert uh, dollars into pleasant working conditions. That's all I have to say. Just one comment. Um, we did survey the unemployed too, um, and we have some uh, some nice questions about their uh, their preferences for work, but also even people who are not. Um, who don't say they're actually looking for work at the time, we ask them, well, you know, if the right opportunity came along, might you consider working, and what might that job look like as well? So I think there's going to be some, some more data to bring to this question that will be along the lines that you were thinking. Bob. Yeah, long ago, uh, Vic Fuchs had a paper, I think it was in the journal of Economic Perspectives, talking about uh, 
about uh, occupational distributions by men and women in, in blacks and whites. And he made the observation that the degree of occupational segregation is far higher by gender than it is by, than it, than it was by race. And uh, kind of in line with, uh, if you're thinking of the, the kind of hedonic model, uh, one of the things that you get out of it is you get sorting. You don't know exactly what the sorting is due to, but one of the things that I think is was striking about some of your graphs is the is the difference between men and women on a number of these on a number of these uh, things, and it seems to me that would actually be a, a direction that would be that would be an interesting thing to do is to sort of really think of the sorting the sorting of people across across these different kinds of of, of uh, Jobs and it doesn't give you a causal statement, but it gives you it gives you I think a lot of clues about what are what, how people how people uh, value various kinds of traits and what's advantageous or disadvantageous for different kinds of people. Thank you, thank you for the paper. It's. Um, I've got a question for you since it's your paper, but actually this question could be for all of the discussants and presenters today, is the practical implications of what we've heard. Um, and it's, we know that we have an aging workforce and a lot of employers are asking how do they manage an aging workforce. And I guess the question is, is there enough here in the science to start having practices that employers might try? Um, and I'll just give you one example that ties together a number of themes. Uh, if the employers had job rotation for older workers, had required training for the older workers, we see evidence that might boost their cognitive abilities. Um, they might think, well, which older workers do I want to keep and which would I like to transition? And I would think using personality types, they might like the conscientious, you know, hold on to the conscientious workers. But the disagreeable ones and the neurotic ones, maybe they find a way to ease them out. Um, and maybe they could structure the job to motivate uh, certain workers to stay and other workers to leave. Is there enough science there to make that practical? Um, are there ethical and legal concerns? So this is a question for you and others. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're hoping to push the science to the point where we have preference estimates, if you will, and um, I mean, sure, you know, in principle, they could be used by employers to alter the structure of jobs, you know, if you're, you're looking to, um, um, you know, if you've got, if there's excess demand for a particular kind of labor and that kind of labor actually prefers more flexible working conditions, say, you might try that to tor try to entice those workers to your, to your firm as opposed to a different so I would say, you know, that's where we're actually hoping to go. Um, you know, whether it actually is used in practice or not, um, I don't know, but it certainly could be used. You know, as for the other, would they, you know, designing particular kinds of policies on the basis of um, personality information, I think I'll have to let somebody else take that on. Gwen, you looked like maybe you were, you had some thoughts. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Gwen Fisher uh, for the purposes of that. Um, so first, I want to just compliment Nicole on an amazing study that I think is really going to hopefully accomplish what you're seeking to do in terms of pushing the envelope. Uh, there are so many measures here that I wish existed in other data sets, and I think the opportunity to empirically assess the preferences and the attributes and to be able to put a value on that is, is fantastic. Um, in response to Steve's question, I, I was like raising my hand really quickly um, because the implications are, are there regarding occupational health and well-being. What we know in the management, the organizational psychology literature, is that working conditions and work environments really matter. They matter for the aging workforce and, and keeping workers in their jobs, keeping people safe, keeping them healthy. Uh, one of the challenges is a legal one, uh, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and employers need to be very careful about offering different things in a way that might be perceived as leading to age discrimination and employment practices, uh, and but we do know a lot about work design and the benefits that that can have. So I, I could certainly talk all day about this. I don't want to take up the airtime, but um, excellent question and, and great research. 
Uh, could I just add one thing in response to that question? Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, I got a telephone call from uh, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal uh, a few days ago. She's writing a story about the fact that, and she sent me copies of the um, uh, advertisement to confirm it, that uh, Swedish companies are advertising jobs um, six hours a day work. Um, I think my guess is that one way to avert age discrimination is to reduce hours of work for everybody. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. I, I would definitely say yes, we have lots and lots of evidence and I think it is more uh, that we have a bottleneck in getting it out there into the field and developing easy to use tools uh, for companies to apply. And um, with the help of the Sloan Foundation at the Columbia Aging Center, we have been for two years now under the guidance of Ruth Finkelstein, developed criteria to describe age smart companies. And uh, it's coming with an award and people, I mean, companies can apply and can um, sort of like um, show what they're doing and learn what they could do better. And it's all of that to echo on what the discussant just said. It's usually life course oriented. It's not targeting whatever the 50 plus or the 60 plus. Uh, because that's another interesting thing from that literature is that you find that measures you take or interactions you uh, entertain with your older workers have the highest impact on turnover rates of younger employees. Because they look at what's happening and they say, well, if that's how they treat the older ones, I better get out of here. So. Ten minutes after five.